The Door in the Wall by Marguerite de Angeli, Chapter 3. As the days grew warmer, the plague abated somewhat. Fewer people came to the hospital for care, and those who had not died became well and went to their homes. The cloisters were once more free of strangers, and the corridors cleared of beds and pallets. Early one bright morning, Brother Luke came for Robin, taking him on his back as before. See that thy hold on strong, he said, for I shall carry thee a good way. Tis good exercise for thine arms to make thee hold on, and will be good exercise for me too, carrying a great lad of ten. Robin laughed because he knew that he was small for his age. I have somewhat in mind for thee, said Brother Luke. He carried Robin in and out of halls and chambers, kitchen and parlor, cloisters and outer court, through refre ref mm -mm, refectory and almonry, stopping, as always, in the chapel to say a prayer. They... Then they went to the gardens at the far side of the monastery. Here thy whittling will be more at home, said the friar, settling Robin in a small trundle cart and giving him the pieces of the little cross, which was almost finished. Brother Michael will welcome thee to his part of the garden when thou'rt weary of being here. Brother Matthew will look out for thee. And yonder is Brother David, the stonemason. Wilt look after Robin? He called to the monk in the carpenter shop. Brother Matthew nodded and left his work to examine what Robin was doing. Fret not, he said. I see he is one of us. Twill be a cross when tis done, said Robin in greeting, putting the two pieces together to show how they went. But how to fasten them, I know not. Could you tell me? I will, surely, the monk assured him. But I have better tools. Come nearer where we can reach them. He moved the trundle cart close to the workbench where he found a chisel. Now we shall make a half joint. So, and fit it right tightly, cutting each piece only halfway through the wood, so the cross piece will just fit into the upright one. He showed Robin how to hold the sharp tool and how carefully he must work so that it wouldn't go through the wood entirely. Then, he explained, we shall secure it with fish glue and the dust which comes from using the rubbing stone to polish the wood will fill in the least crack and make all smooth. He went back to his work. Robin, too, went to work. It was exciting to use the sharp chisel. It slid easily into the wood, peeling off the smallest slivers, which fell in a pleasant litter, excuse me, around him. Soon the square place appeared where the other piece of wood should fit. For some reason, he did not know Robin felt very content. He loved the smell of the wood he was whittling, even the acrid smell of the oak that Brother Matthew was working. He liked the sharp whistle of the plane as it slid over the board and the ringing sound of the chisel on stone from the mason's shed. Even the tiresome call of the cuckoo on the walnut tree was only a pleasant sound of summer. The sky above was like the garnet of our, o of our Lady, blue, gold-bordered. Robin stopped to rest, watching the birds that darted across the garden. He felt so strong that he was sure he soon would be able to get up and walk. He began to whistle and set to work again. For a long time, only those homely sounds were heard in the garden close for the monks did not talk at their work. Then it happened. The sharp chisel slipped and cut a gash across the long piece of the cross. It broke. 
Away flew the other piece as far as Robin could throw it, and after it went the chisel, narrowly missing Brother Matthew's head. Robin's face was drawn into a black cloud of anger, and if he had been able, he would have stormed out of the garden. But he was bound to stay where he was, so he took out his anger in words. Treacherous, misguided tool, he shouted. I'll have no more of you. Brother Matthew looked up in astonishment. Tis not the tool that is at fault, but thine unskilled hands, he said quietly. Sorry. <laughs> if thou'rt to learn to use it, patience and care are better teachers than a bad temper. That would be good for my daughter to know. <laughs> Thank you, but I am not a carpenter, son, and apprentice. But Brother Matthew kept his steady gaze on Robin's anger. He kept his steady gaze on Robin. Anger evaporated. He covered his eyes with his arms and wished he'd been truly a carpenter's son. Then his father would have been away at would not have been away at war. At the wars or his mother in waiting upon the queen. They would have been at home, and he with them. Tomorrow is another day, comforted Brother Matthew. Take thy rest now, and thou wilt do better work next time. Here is Brother Luke coming to care for thee. I shall not tell him how nearly I lost my head. Brother Matthew's eyes twinkled as he reassured Robin. He would, he had given him a questioning look. Mm -mm. Please forgive me, let me, re let me read that again. Tomorrow is another day, comforted Brother Matthew. Take thy rest for now, and thou wilt do better work next time. Here is Brother Luke coming to take care for thee. I shall not tell him how nearly I lost my head. Brother Matthew's eyes twinkled as he reassured Robin, who had given him, given him a questioning look. Later, while the good friar cared for him, rubbing his legs and back, working the muscles of his hands and arms, he said, I was tired, but now I feel better. You are very kind. I see thou art getting stronger. It may be that this rubbing helps thee. How? I know not. I am no physician. I am but a foolish friar, but it may stir up thy blood and make thee more comfortable. God's good time, his sunshine, and the love that is born thee are all healing. A bright spirit helps too, and that thou hast. Today in the garden I felt that soon I should walk, said Robin. I must get well before my father returns from the wars. Whether thou walk soon, I know not. This I know. We must teach thy hands to be skillful, skillful in many ways. And we must teach thy mind to go about whether thy legs will carry thee or no. For reading is another door in the wall. Dost understand, my son? Robin smiled and nodded. Yes, he said. I see now what you mean by the door in the wall. We shall read together. Then there is somewhat of the earth and stars that Brother Hubert Herbert can tell thee. How they go in their seasons, so that in summer, when we rise for the midnight office, Orion is here. Yet in winter, at the same hour, he is over there. Yet, no, I'm sorry, Brother Luke stopped rubbing to point in different directions overhead as he went on. Some say that the earth extendeth just thus, just, just so far, then droppeth off into the vast sea. Perhaps it is so, I know not. But if it be so, how come the stars out again in their season? Who knows? Not I. But someday we shall know all. 
Well, you teach me right too? Will you teach me to write too? And how to make letters as you promised? Robin asked. It sounds exciting now to learn, and I wish to send a letter to my father. We shall begin today. We shall divide the days into teaching thy mind and teaching thy hands. Then weariness shall not give thee excuse for discouragement. Then Robin knew that Brother Luke had seen him throw the piece of cross and the chisel. Yet the friar neither spoke of it nor showed in any way that he was disappointed. Rest while I am gone, continued Brother Luke, and I shall bring quill and parchment to pen a letter for thee. It so happens that a hundred men at arms and a hundred foot soldiers have sworn to serve loyally their king and the city of London are leaving for the Scottish border tomorrow. With them goes a minstrel well, well known to us, one John on John go in the wind. He was he will gladly carry thy letter and will and put it into thy father's hands. He soon returned with pen, ink pot, and parchment, and arranged them on the desk near Robin. Say this, Robin began, then went on to dictate the words as the monk penned them. Sir John D. Burford, from his son Robin, greetings. It is a fine thing that your son Robin is left to care of strangers, to the care of strangers. Had it not been for Brother Luke, who is writing this letter, I should be dead. As you know, my lady mother had been commanded to attend to the queen at Windsor, and I was left to wait the coming of John the Fletcher in the care of Dame Ellen. Just before the Feast of St. Matthew, the 24th of February, I woke one morning, unable to rise from my bed, being very ill, so that when John the Fletcher came to take me to my Lord Peter de Lindsay's castle in Shropshire, I was unable to go. Wherefore, he sent a physician to care for me, who came not again, but left me, as before, in Dame Ellen's care. The men at arms are with you, as well you know. The house servants, even old Gregory, have left our service, for the plague had them. Ellen, too, was taken of it, and I was left alone and helpless. My legs are as useless as two sausages, bent ones. Now I am in the care of this good brother at St. Matthew's. How then shall I do? Send me a letter, I beg you, and farewell. Now attend, said Brother Luke. I shall read this slowly, pointing out each letter and word, so this may be thy first lesson. The two heads bent over the parchment together. Brother Luke's town shirred, robins dark and thickly thatched. Oh, said Robin, you have made it look like poetry with red capitals. Yes, agreed Brother Luke, but when it is read to thee, twill not sound like poetry. I'll vow, thou hast not minced words in thy letter. Slowly and carefully, he spelled out the letter to Robin, who would not change a word of it, but signed his name with Brother Luke guiding his hand. The friar folded it and took it to the scriptorium to seal before sending it off, then gave it to John Go in the Wind, who waited. And look at that, what a cool picture. There's a picture of the friar and Robin looking over the letter. I thought that was quite cool. And that is the end of 
Chapter 3 The Door in the Wind The Door in the Wall by Marguerite de Angeli I'll see you next time.